From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. One of the most common questions garden centers and other garden professionals are asked these days, how can I add more pollinator plants? Today's guest designs ecological gardens with such beneficial insects in mind and is the author of the new book, The Pollinator Victory Garden. More in a moment, but first this message. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. Kim Ironman is founder of Eco Beneficial, consulting on ecological landscaping and design. Based in Westchester County, New York, Kim speaks nationwide to spread her passion for habitat-style plantings, creates an occasional podcast series on the subject, and is the author of the new book, The Pollinator Victory Garden. Welcome, Kim. I think we all need a pollinator victory garden, oh. don't we? Th- thank you for having me, Margaret. Yes, especially after the winter. I tell you, I'd like to see some of the guys buzzing around. <laughs> <laughs> very, very soon. Yes. So I should say before we get started that we'll have a book giveaway on A Way to Garden with the transcript um, of this show so people can come and get all the details and more links and pictures and, and enter the book giveaway. So I guess the place to start is the basics, like why to your mind native is important and how do you define in your work how do you define what native means because over the years i've heard many many definitions and it's evolved and i'm just interested to see where you are on that sure yeah uh yeah it can be very confusing to people that are trying to make the transition to native to figure out what the heck that means yeah so um i always default to uh the federal executive order as scintillating as that (laughs) sounds and they and they define native species as plants and animals that occur naturally, either presently or historically, in any ecosystem in the U.S. So how do I use that? Well, I try to apply this um, to regional ecosystems, to use a geographic qualifier with the word native. So um, our best practice would be to garden with plants that are native to our particular county or area. And again, it would, they would have to be properly adapted to our site because not all sites are the same. And then we might have a broader definition native to the Northeast or, you know, so on and so on. So why is this important? Uh, it comes down to this one simple word, evolution. Yeah. The evolutionary interconnections between plants and animals and sometimes between plants themselves really, really important. And I think the poster child for this uh, over the last decade has been uh, the monarch butterfly and its obligate larval host plant, um, milkweeds, the 100-plus right. species of milkweeds in the United States. But there's so many other connections um, that sometimes we just don't even know about yeah. um, that make native plants particularly important. But uh, my book covers, I don't know, probably 10 points of why natives are important. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. And, and, and so, um, so you're going somewhat local, yes? Regional or local, yes? Really try to focus on, yes, regional yes. native plants, yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, I know that, you know, you just mentioned Northeast. Both of us are in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. But the great thing when I came to the site and when I looked at the book, you provide information and um, plant lists and so forth. You have... Uh, where we can come to the website and find access to databases of plants no matter where we live. Right. I have a lot of regional lists. Uh, In addition to what you see in the book, there are a lot of regional lists of uh, pollinator plants um, that cover North America. Um, But I I really encourage um, folks to do a little research. Yes. Just don't blindly look at a list. So get a reference, understand kind of where that's taking you, and then please um, investigate and join your local Native Plant Society. Where you are be the Native Plant Trust. Uh, where I am, it's the Native Plant Center of New York. And uh, there are so many great Native plant organizations that have uh, regional plant lists on their website. New Jersey is a case in point. California right. is a fantastic website with Native plants. So do a little digging is my is my answer. There's no one size fits all here. And since I have readers and listeners all over the place, I have done a little digging and I have a list. And what I'll do is that it involves some of the ones like Cal Flora and um, mm-hmm. the New York State um, 
the floor of New York State, the Planet right, Atlas, and so forth, Atlas. Mm-hmm. and so and some other ones, comparable ones sure. around the country. So what I'll do is, since we're talking about it with the link with the transcript of this show, I'll give a link to that. Obviously, I haven't done every single one, but I love your suggestion. Just like with birders, people say, "Well, how can I learn about this? How can I learn about that?" And I'm like, "Sure, go to your local bird club's website. Go to a meeting. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's the best way to find out from other people who are into it in your area, right?" And I have a lot of uh, resource uh, websites and books on yes. um, the Pollinator Victory Garden part of my website yes. to help readers kind of get to the right resource. Good. So we'll give all the, those good links. So, mm-hmm. okay, so now we sort of set the stage. That's what we're talking about. We're, so we're talking about local, and even though many plants are native to the United States, to other regions, you know, um, something that's a prairie plant, that's not native to the Northeast, so it's not native for me and so forth. So matching to your, mm-hmm. yeah. So so now that we've kind of established that, as we walk around um, our yards this spring, we gardeners, um, you know, and as you do with clients, prospective clients or established clients you're visiting again, kind of where are some of the spots in the landscape as you're walking around doing a consult or whatever that you are looking to find to sort of transform into more native mm-hmm. heavy areas. Are there places you're on the lookout for because you have this expertise? Absolutely. Yeah. So my number one target is the lawn, what I call the green desert. It truly <laughs> is an ecological wasteland for pollinators. So it can be a bit much to ask someone who's had a lawn for 20, 30 more years um, to give it all up. And I think that's often unrealistic. So I suggest that we start with small areas um, and replace lawn with what I call pollinator islands. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to do, and we can uh, include more islands over time and connect them to create uh, bigger landscapes. But um, I find that with, um, with most of us, if a project becomes too large and overwhelming, we don't do it at all. So better that we get started with smaller spaces. And um, an example of kind of a no-brainer conversion to a pollinator uh, area would be a hillside that is currently in turf grass. Who wants to mow that? (laughs) Not Margaret, Kim, not Margaret. (laughs) No, no. So why not just let's get rid of that and think about lower-growing plants, perhaps meadow-like plants. We can do a formal or an informal design depending on uh, the person's taste. Um, but why not um, take the, the low-hanging fruit and convert it into, um, into a pollinator habitat and garden? And uh, I really recommend that you start with an area that you're going to see all the time. So maybe if you're looking, if you're a cook like me and you're always in the kitchen and you're looking out the window, get a garden out there. So you, you kind of see what's going on and you start to appreciate what the function of a pollinator garden uh, is really doing all the different creatures that are coming. And I, I really believe in all garden design. I'm not a garden designer like you are, you know, but I always say when I'm lecturing, I say, hey, you know, go inside, look out the window, see mm-hmm. where you, what your vistas are, what your, you know, what axial views you have from the key windows that you use your house in, because that's where you're going to be able to pat yourself on the back and get some reward for your work. And Absolutely. You know what I mean? And even yeah. even to including some seating areas outdoors. So when yes. you're in the garden, be in the garden. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, like in the middle of the action, make an area where you can actually enjoy what's going on, seeing the hummingbirds and the bees and the butterflies, et cetera. Yeah. So we hear and read on podcasts or garden lectures and books about habitat style gardening to plant in layers. That phrase is often used and, you know, not to plant the way we do, you know, a 30-foot tree and a three-inch lawn or just having miles of three-inch lawn, but plant like nature does in layers. And you say in the book, though, when advocating for lawn reduction, you say don't replace one monoculture with another. So tell us about that. Sure. So, say we're looking at the lawn and we're thinking, oh, we're going to make this uh, pollinator garden. Well, there's a temptation to just choose one plant. And that doesn't really work well for pollinators because um, many different, there are many different types of pollinators, bees, butterflies, bats, moths, depending on where you are in the country. You know, beetles are the largest group of pollinators. And they all have different um, preferences of uh, pollinator plants. They also are active at different times of year. So when we're designing, we really need to think about, first of all, diversity. So we have a diverse array of plants that attract a diverse array of pollinators. And um, just an example, you know, hummingbirds really love red tubular flowers. They don't 
it's not cast in stone. They don't always go to them, but those are their favorites. But um, a very small bee will probably need a very open um, flower because it doesn't have a lot of body strength or tongue length, and it will prefer a bright white or a yellow or violet or blue-colored flower. So the diversity of bloom is really important, but also the succession of bloom yes. is really key. From depending on where you are, if you're in California, you're gonna, you know, you're starting. You've already started your gardening probably in certain parts of California, but for us here in the Northeast, you know, early spring through late fall. And um, although we want to have diversity of bloom, we also have to have sufficiency of bloom. I call that achieving floral balance. So what's that about? Well. Um, pollinators like bees and butterflies um, have a behavior called floral constancy or floral fidelity. And that means when they go off on a foraging mission, they're looking for one species of plant. So we need to provide targets for them to accommodate that. And that can be done in a couple ways. One, we can create a big group of plants of one species. Um, research at the University of California has shown that a one square meter grouping is ideal. But we can't always do that because of space, considerations, right. et cetera. So another way to approach it is to repeat smaller groupings in the landscape. The pollinators will find them. Or to have a meadowscape type, type of arrangement with an erratic um, amount of bloom. But um, it's all about biodiversity when, when we're thinking of pollinators and especially in the face of climate change. So when, we're, when we bring home native plants from the garden center, we're not, we shouldn't, just like when we're trying to design any garden, even just for pure aesthetics and even mm -hmm. of, of non-natives, bringing onesies home, one of this, one of that, one of the other thing, isn't going to do the trick, even though we can say, oh, I have 20 new native plants in my garden. We want to have this a little bit of a mass of uh, each type, yes? Like you're Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. Yeah. So okay. trees and shrubs kind of help us out a little bit, yeah. especially the larger ones, because we've got good biomass there. Yeah. Um, so we might be able to get away with, um, you know, one of a given shrub or tree, but, um, you know, just be aware that many of our plants that are native do require a pollinator partner. That's what I call them. They may either be like our native hollies or dioecious, male and female plants, and we need both to uh, provide the pollen on the male plants, for, um, f particularly for bees, to, to um, uh, build their brood. It's, it's the main source of protein, but also the fruit on the females. So a lot of these plants are dioecious, and a lot of plants, like our native viburnums, even though they don't have different sexes, they're not always reliably self-fruitful. No. I mean, they need a genetically different partner near them for cross-pollination by insects to produce fruit. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of homework is a good thing, gardeners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? It right. seems really simple until you start doing it. And I it, know. it requires some knowledge. So, know. you know, align yourself with a great local nursery that knows this stuff that can help you out. Join your Native Plant Society. Go to uh, volunteer events. Uh, for example, plant sales in the, in the spring. We're just getting into that season. There's so many Native plant sales where knowledgeable people help you choose the right plants and uh, get you a little bit further down the road with yeah. this. So it's not all about adding plants. I mean, the book, um, your approach, it's not all about just adding more plants. It's also about other um, sort of ecosystem supporting cultural tactics, like, for example, not using chemicals, very important. Mm -hmm. um, so some of us are starting our spring cleanup, um, or maybe in warmer zones than you and I are in. They've, you've already, they've already started. You have, toward the end of the book, a page with some eco-beneficial cultural tips for each season. And I just thought we could kind of go over some of the spring ones to get us off to a smart, eco-beneficial kind of a, a sure. start, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the ways that you would approach cleanup that might be a little different from the old days. Well, I, I think the first order of business is to remember that you're not just providing floor resources, you're providing habitat. You're right. providing a place where pollinators are living, overwintering in some cases, nesting, hiding, getting protection from predators, etc. So your garden's an ecosystem. Whether you want an ecosystem or not, it is. <laughs> so if we, if we start thinking in that way, we can be much much more successful in, in um, planting for, for pollinators and providing all of the resources. Um, so cleanup is, is tricky. Because uh, if you're like me, you know, the way I learned as a gardener was to be meticulously clean. Well, the Nellie need in me has long since vanished. 
<laughs> Me too, Kim. I, I have to say that's been the biggest change. The way that I clean up fall and spring is the biggest change since I started to understand mm-hmm. some of this stuff. So. And so, and why? Well, we might like it neat and tidy, but, you know, that's not always great for, um, for nature and for wildlife. So just thinking back to the fall, what should we have done or not done? Well, for those of us who live in a forested ecosystem here in the Northeast, lots of the Midwest, et cetera, depending on where you are, um, we have forests. We have trees. We kind of emulate those systems in our own landscapes uh, with those layers that we've been talking about. And, of course, trees do what? They drop their leaves. That's what's supposed to happen. Uh, Those leaves uh, then decompose, uh, macro and micro uh, invertebrates that are going to help decompose those leaves, and they develop um, essentially a a nutrient cycling system um, for our soil. So there's something else that goes on there, too, which uh, really is an implication for why you need to keep leaves in place. There are tons of invertebrates in that leaf litter. Yes. Tons. Tons. Yeah. And so maybe there's a morning cloak butterfly that can overwinter as an adult in leaf litter. Um, it has a chemical in its body that's like antifreeze, and it can actually survive that way. Yes, or, or under maybe, a little bark. I'm sorry, even. go ahead. Sometimes under a little bark, it might hide under some bark yep, on a that, tree. That yeah, that too. But yeah. That, that leaf litter, yes, there are lots right. of uh, critters in an immature stage or sometimes in a mature stage that are really crucial for healthy ecosystems. And then think in the spring when migrating birds are coming back and they are looking for food. And, you know, for all of us who um, know and love Doug Tallamy's work and his book, Bringing Nature Home, we've learned that, you know, like 96% of land birds feed insects to the young. Right. So we need a lot of insects in our landscapes. Right. So in the spring, so what do you do? So you've left all this stuff. You haven't cut your perennials back um, in the fall. You haven't moved the, uh, the leaves. Those perennials, by the way, particularly pithy stem ones, can become habitat. Um, so if sometimes you'll see that, gosh, if you uh, have a broken off stem in the, in the garden, you might have an aggregation of, of uh, say, ladybugs that overwinter as adults in that pithy stem, or it could be an overwintering bee. There are, there's a lot of activity going on in the garden that we may not be noticing. And, of course, by leaving our perennials up, we're also providing a seed source for, um, for birds that are overwintering and other mammals. So when do we start cutting back? That's a tough one. Yeah. Climate change has made this really challenging. <clears throat> yes. Yes. And we, we can't always predict, you know, um, what the temperature is going to be at any given time of year. So my general suggestion is wait until we've had a consistent number of days where we're, we're well into the 50s, because that's when insect activity starts up. And make sure that when you start to cut back your garden, you're doing so when the soil's not soaking wet, because the enemy of healthy soil is compacted soil. Yes. When we step on wet soil, bad news. So, and then take it easy, easy, slowly, slowly. Instead of cutting everything back the same day, stage it. You know, maybe not all the insects in your landscape have woken up. Um, maybe we're going to get a cold spell when you think, oh, you know, we're now in spring. Maybe we're not so much now in spring. So those are my suggestions right. in terms of cleanup. Right. Okay. So we're going to be a little bit slower, and we're not going to go through there with a giant, you know, blower, weed whacker. shredder, <laughs> weed whacker, oh, my goodness, you know, assault on nature kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, gentle, okay. gentle. Okay. So the book and also the movement sort of of ecological landscaping, they have this message of, connectivity, I think. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, you and Kim in your yard, Margaret over in my yard, we can do things, but it's even better if we connect the dots. And Doug Tallamy's new book, a lot of, a lot mm-hmm. of it um, is about, uh, about that, about how we can kind of create this homegrown national park by all making our contributing our small piece you know and and um so so i know that uh you do a podcast and one of your interviews i think it was in december 2019 was with the founder of b city usa i think Mm -hmm. and styles yeah yeah and and so that's an example of a a sort of blown up you know a big um uh connectivity program and i wondered if you could kind of just 
talk to us about why connectivity, why not just doing this as a little isolated island is so important. Sure. Yeah. Well, you, you can, you know, just kind of see yourself that if um, the only resource, and sadly this is the case in much of Westchester where I live, if you, the only resource is a little patch of landscape, the pollinators that um, you're trying to attract and support are, are very limited in terms of what they have um, available to them. Um, and to get to the next landscape that might be a quarter mile away, well, that's, that's a bit of a challenge. And some of our pollinators um, travel a fair amount of, uh, of mileage. You know, like a bumblebee, a strong bumblebee can go a mile. A little bee might only go 100 feet. But hummingbirds and right. you know, some of our other um, winged pollinators are going to be able to travel uh, butterflies, you know, long distances. So um, if we think of monarchs as a model, that kind of gives us a goal, is we need to help them along their entire route, whatever that may be. And so having uh, landscapes that are connected in terms of resources and habitat really helps. It's very much like um, the wildlife um, uh, pathways that um, uh, have existed for many decades uh, with um, wildlife uh, managers. You know, if you go out into, uh, say, Montana or parts of the West, you will see these wildlife ramps over right. highways right. for large, you know, animals to actually get safely from one area to another. Well, well, pity the poor bee, for example, that's trying to get from your one patch of, of uh, habitat and forage to another area, and it's got to cross a highway. <laughs> right. Uh, it, but much better that your neighbors have more resources and they don't have to travel as far. So communicating so, really with making known what you're doing and communicating and, and sort of joining some of these group efforts? Totally. And influencing neighbors, family, and friends. Um, I've had a number of clients who, uh, after we've installed uh, landscapes uh, that are ecological, pollinator-friendly, they'll have me come do a walk and talk in their garden and we'll give plants away to their neighbors and friends and do kind of a formal arrangement, you know, a little garden tour and explanation and get people jazzed up about this. I think most people want to help. They just don't know, always know what to do. So sharing that, that, um, that message and signage, I think, is tremendously underutilized in our landscapes. So whether it's a, you know, a pollinator garden sign, a Zer the Xerces Society is a fantastic resource for one of those. That's um, a nonprofit organization that's akin to, uh, I've heard it described as the, um, counterpart to Audubon, but for invertebrates. Mm -hmm. um, but get signage uh, in your landscape where people can see it and uh, get that message out that you're gardening differently, you're gardening with a purpose. Um, and then, of course, you know, sharing your garden, um, have garden parties, um, uh, provide opportunities for people to kind of see how this works, and find some uh, volunteer opportunities, um, your local church or school, et cetera, um, that um, maybe has some vacant uh, area that you could uh, help turn into a pollinator garden. And then we can take it even further, like uh, it's going on now in uh, the Northeast, uh, with the poll pollinator pathway movement, where it, throughout Westchester County and a good part of Fairfield County, Connecticut, um, different municipalities are joining the pollinator pathways, and you can get your particular landscape on the map, and there's a big push to educate, inform, and assist folks in doing that. Mm. Well, um, we're running... Sh so we're running short on time, but I wanted just to tell everybody that, again, we're going to have a book giveaway with the transcript. There's a great appendix at the back, which is kind of a short course, 10 Tips for a Thriving Pollinator Victory Garden. We've covered most of them, and I'm, I'll am i add in the transcript any that we missed. But um, thank you so much, Kim. I mean, I think it's such an important message. I'll also give links, by the way, to Bee City USA, which I want to learn more about. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the tip on that. Um, and, and thank you for making the time today. Well, thank you so much for having Margaret. It's, it's been my pleasure. I hope I'll talk to you soon again. Thanks. Thanks. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. And I hope I'll talk to all the rest of you soon again, too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version on Stitcher, or iTunes, or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or at Facebook or on Instagram as at awaytogarden. And happy gardening meantime. 
Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.